Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Edward H. Crane, beloved founder and president emeritus of the Cato Institute. I guess we'll start at the very beginning. How did you become a libertarian? Well, I used to say, and it can't really be true, that I've always been. I can't remember when I wasn't a libertarian, but I guess I started out as a uh, Goldwater Republican, you know, conservative. Uh, but as soon as I read libertarian stuff, whether it was, you know, Ayn Rand or uh, Isabel Patterson, uh, the sense of liberty being across the board and, and doesn't stop at the economic border. Uh, always made sense to me. And and so I guess I've always been a libertarian. I, my father was a conservative doctor who uh, didn't really know much about public policy, and my mother didn't care about it. But I always was attracted to the libertarian perspective. And you grew up in uh, California, correct? Well, I was raised there. It's not clear how much I grew up. But I was uh, uh, in Southern California and uh, – Went to high school there and, and then uh, went to the University of Redlands for my freshman year uh, and then on to Berkeley. Redlands said they would not kick me out if I did not come back. And uh, They would <laughs> – what did you do? <laughs> well, they had rules. You couldn't have women or liquor in your, uh, in your dorm. Oh, that's horrendous. Uh, either one would have done me in. And, uh, <laughs> and so I went to Berkeley where I was, you know, I was a radical at Redlands at Berkeley. I was just another one of the guys. <laughs> and then uh, you got involved. How did you get involved with the movement, so to speak, actual professional libertarianism? I don't think before I came around there was a, a professional uh, libertarian job out there. I was the, kind of the first employee. But uh, well, at least people working for a broader the Libertarian yeah. Party. Well, I, I I became a member of Youth for Goldwater at Berkeley, which was kind of a small group, as you might imagine. <laughs> and I, I was a precinct captain for two precincts in, in Berkeley, and uh, I, we got six votes in one precinct and seven in the other. I knew the names of all the votes. I was kind of fanatic Goldwater guy, although I I was less enthusiastic when he, he flipped on Social Security and. Um, uh, but, you know, I really admired the guy. When you think about um, the end of the New Deal being maybe 1952, um, it's remarkable that within eight years, the um, the number one political book in America was The Conscience of a Conservative, which really uh, is, still holds together today if you read it, but it was a repudiation of the New Deal across the board. And uh, that's why it's, uh, you know, there are many reasons why it's a shame that Kennedy was killed. But they, he and Goldwater were planning to debate issues, go around the country together. They liked each other. And uh, and that would have been a nice thing to see. I mean, Kennedy would have won anyway, I think. But certainly once he was killed, Gold, Goldwater himself said he knew at that moment that he, Goldwater, would never be president of the United States. So I guess before you became the first professional Libertarian, I suppose. What did at that time? What did the libertarian movement look like? Well, I, I went to the first uh, uh, Libertarian Party convention in uh, Denver. Which I think it was in yeah, Denver, which is yeah. my hometown. So. Uh, and uh, it was at the Radisson Hotel in June of, of uh, 1972. And I walked into that place. And as a libertarian, I've always known it was appropriate to be tolerant of alternative lifestyles. But until I walked into that room, I really had no idea how many alternatives <laughs> there were. I've told that story before, but I mean, it's, uh, there were, there were Randians, you know, with black capes and long cigarette holders. There were gold bugs draped in gold. There were anarchists in black. And, uh, but God damn it, they were all people who believed in liberty and I think there were 85 of them and they were they were very excited that they were from 13 states that was you know you get it and um, it was an interesting group of people I, I went up to the suite with about a dozen people uh, John Hospers who was the nominee and uh, and uh, was there while they were writing the statement of principles 
which I think has kind of gone by the side, but uh, he had to sign this thing to become a member of the Libertarian Party. But John Hospers was a remarkable man, a very well-respected philosopher at the University of Southern California, and a tenured guy, but he took a big risk to do this and run for president. His running mate was a gal named Tony Nathan, who passed away just last year. Uh, she was a wonderful person, and uh, she was a radio broadcaster, and um, I got a call. I was working for uh, Scudder Stevenson Clark, an investment firm in Los Angeles, and I got a call from her, and I said, she said, Ed, I need a campaign manager. And I said, Tony, to begin with, you're running for vice president, <laughs> and beyond that, you're on the ballot in two states. So I, you know, with all the due respect against you, yes. Yeah, you're not going to win. <laughs> and she was in, the, let me see, Colorado and Washington State, I think. Which are so, now the two marijuana states. Yeah, well, we yes, see, we got started early there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she was um, um, uh, insistent. And uh, she said, you don't have to do anything. I just need your name on the stationery. I said, okay. So I was, so if. If you're ever asked uh, who the campaign manager for the first woman in American history to receive an electoral college vote was, it's me, old Ed Crane, um, because she did win. And I was in a car with uh, John Hospers going to some speech in Los Angeles because we were both there. And uh, and he says, in the, he says, you know, we're going to get a, a electoral college vote. And uh, I said, no, you're not, John. And he said, yeah, no, I just talked to this guy, Roger McBride. And he's a Nixon elector in Virginia. And sure enough, uh, Roger voted uh, making Tony Nathan the first woman in history to receive an electoral college vote and making the Libertarian Party a third place finisher in the uh, electoral college anyway. Now, did that actually – that, was that a story outside of, of your life, your Libertarian, the, the world then? Was it a story that this elector had defected? Yeah, I can't remember that happening in my life. Maybe it has. No, Roger had actually written a thesis in, in college on uh, um, on how the Constitution allows electors to um, to um, vote their conscience. They don't have to, even if they're committed, they don't have to vote for that person. And he sent a copy of the. It was a book. I forget what the title was. And he sent it to all the Virginia electors, so they had been forewarned, he felt. And um, so he did that. And then – How does a guy who writes that – a thesis like that end up getting chosen as an elector? Well, because <laughs> – It seems like the people who choose made a bad choice, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't think – I don't think electors are vetted. I mean they, you look for contribution levels and that sort of thing. So um, that, that's that's that, how I got started. And then And then – so after the 72 campaign ended, or the, uh, you found yourself uh, at, with the LP, the Libertarian Party, or were you – Yeah. No, I, I – uh, coming out of the convention in Denver, I was uh, – I, I lost a, a coin flip and became uh, vice chairman of the Libertarian Party of California. And there were 20 um, regions – and this is information that nobody wants to hear about, but you ask me – and I was in charge of 12 regions, and I would take my little 240Z, and I went all over Southern California. And I think by the time I left, they had 10 of the regions had their own newsletters, and we were really getting something. I was I was uh, excited that uh, that um, Hospers got 980 write-in votes in California. I had no idea there were 980 libertarians in the world. But and to go to the trouble of doing that, and how did they find out he was a writing candidate? Uh, that kind of encouraged me, and so uh, I, uh, I guess it was in uh, Dallas. I was elected national chairman of the party. Um, you know, I had gotten in it because I thought it was a libertine party, <laughs> and by the time I found out, I was national chairman. It was it was too late to get out. And I, I – uh, the party had been set up by David and Susan Nolan and they were very good people in famous Nolan chart and everything. But they were not good organizers and uh, when I took over, they handed me a shoebox with, uh, you know, three by five cards in it and there maybe was a couple hundred. And uh, they sent the newsletter only to people whose dues were uh, paid up. 
so maybe 150 people got the newsletter and I I immediately, you know, went to a, a newsprint and we sent the newsletter to any list we could find and, and started to grow the organization. It did pretty well, I think. We By 1976, um, McBride uh, had said to me that if you quit your lucrative investment job and become national chairman, I'll, I'll run for president in 1976. And... and um, you know, not only did he wear a coat and tie, but he had his own private airplane and uh, a DC-3, which is a little scary. But um, uh, I thought that was cool. So I did. I was uh, – by then I was with Alliance Capital Management Corporation, and uh, I was the youngest vice president in the firm, and I gave all that up, um, and which my wife says it was a big mistake because uh, – you could have made all that money, and uh, I'd like to point out if I hadn't done that, I never would have met you. <laughs> but I maybe that's what she meant, that it was uh, – Well, so she, we, wouldn't, she, we wouldn't be sitting here now. Either. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I uh, ran uh, McBride's campaign out of uh, Washington in 76. While we're still on the – talking about the LP, maybe we could take this as an opportunity to – clear up a confusion that I get on Facebook and Twitter. People will ask questions of libertarianism.org's Twitter account thinking that we are the LP. And so what's the difference? Is there a difference between the Libertarian Party, Libertarianism with a capital L, and the Libertarian movement or Libertarianism in general with a lowercase l? Well, Beck, when I was running uh – uh, the uh, Libertarian Party was just libertarianism. I mean, we, the foreign policy and civil liberties was all a big part of what we were doing. And uh, um, so, no, I don't think there's a difference. I, I mean, the the cards are so stacked against third parties in this country that, uh, you know, I was uh, naive to think, uh, I, I honestly thought I could create a third party. And, uh, yeah, I still think that it, it could have happened. And when when Ed Clark ran in 1980, we got on the ballot in all 50 states, which was a hell of an achievement back then. It's hard enough now, but uh, back then it was next to impossible. You had to break many many laws and petitioning and so forth to to get in there. But um, Howie Rich was uh, in charge of the. Uh, he's one of the great grassroots organizers ever. Uh, both in terms of what he did to get Ed Clark on the ballot in all 50 states, but also uh, what he did with the term limits movement. But that's another story. But libertarianism and the Libertarian Party are different things. I think that was Aaron's question. They're, or at least we're not – a lot of people think Cato is actually associated with the Libertarian Party in some way or has some sort of official arm of it, but it, – it's it's not we're not if people were wondering. <laughs> no, no, the Cato is not. I mean, obviously, a political party is going to act differently and do different things than a think tank will. Uh, but I think uh, you know the philosophy uh, is the same. I don't think there's any um, fundamental difference. It's it's just that you can't be successful as a third party in this country. So. Um so we so we got to seventy six uh, with uh, the McBride campaign, and then you finished the McBride campaign. By the way, McBride was on the ballot in thirty one states, which was more than Gene McCarthy, who had almost really? got the Democratic nomination four years earlier. Yeah, interesting. And we interesting. became good yeah. friends with Gene, actually. Oh, he's a he's a pillar in the campaign finance world too, of course. Absolutely. Um, what what's what was involved in getting on thirty one states? I mean, what sort of I mean, well, you said have, it was complicated, but what sort of hoops does one have to jump through to get on? Well, you'll, you'll, you'll have some states where you have to get so many signatures in each county and it has to be – and you have to have an elector from that county or an individual uh, to collect the signatures. That's where some breaking the law comes in. And uh, and and uh, are, are ridiculous like West Virginia had incredible uh, numbers you had to – and Maryland did too uh, – that just made it next to impossible. We had uh, – I, I remember once uh, uh, we got a call from uh, North Carolina where um, the authorities had arrested the guy in charge of our petitioning there. 
because he was behind and uh, and we were all yelling at the people in the states to make sure you get your signatures in time and so he decided to speed things up he would uh fake names and to, and his brilliant idea was he's going to take names out of the phone book for lawyers because they probably are registered <laughs> and, uh, and and so this secretary is going through the things she said you know i don't i don't think judge so and so would have signed this petition and so they demanded that this guy uh give a public apology they were quite nice about it actually they could have just said you're not on the ballot and and we're going to arrest you for 60 days or something uh, but they gave this guy a chance to publicly apologize. Rather than do that, he jumped off a bridge. And, uh, you know, being a libertarian, he didn't kill himself. But it uh, it was kind of a humorous uh, thing. We wait, eventually wait, wait. got on the ballot there. What do you mean he jumped off a bridge to, to kill himself? To kill himself. Yeah. But oh, okay. He, he'd he rather was kill inept. himself. Yeah. 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 But, oh, being a libertarian, he was inept. So that's yeah. why he failed at killing himself. Do I have himself. to explain all these things? <laughs> I, was, I was just a little confused there for a second. <laughs> so and after 76, uh, Cato starts in 77. Um, Cato started in 1977. I had, uh, um, you know, I can't talk about Charles Koch. But I, I will say that uh, I met him through Roger McBride. They were both members of the Mont Pelerin Society. And Roger had said, you need to meet this guy in Wichita who's quite wealthy. Not quite as wealthy as he is today, but still substantial. And so I did, and uh, he and I hit it off. And, and uh, um, he said, uh, you know, he was impressed with what we did with McBride. We were in like five network TV ads and, and you got on the ballot and all those things and put out literature that was fairly well done. Uh, and um, so he said, what would it take to keep you in the, in the movement? And uh, I said, well, I've, I've been impressed here in Washington with the leverage that Brookings and AEI have. And it'd be, you know, Brookings is just a, a, a typical liberal institution and AEI is, was not even conservative then, it was just pro-business. Uh, but I, I said it'd be great to have a libertarian think tank, and so he, he talked me into uh, to uh, agreeing to start the Cato Institute. And uh, I said, um, you know, if you're going to have a libertarian think tank, you don't want me to run it because I'm going back to San Francisco, and uh, it should be in New York or Washington. And Charles being significantly smarter than I am, said, no, no, we'll set it up in uh, in San Francisco and see how it goes, and knowing full well that I myself would bring it back out, <laughs> which I did in 1981. Um, but that's how that's how Cato got started. Now, what about um, the role uh, some of our listeners would be interested in, and me too, about Murray Rothbard? And how he His got involvement involved with Cato originally, and like how you first met him, and that that. Well, he was a you know Murray was a hero to anyone who was a libertarian back then, and, and including Charles Koch. And so he was actually asked to be on the board of the Cato Institute as original um, uh, board member, and uh, Murray is the guy who uh, came up with the name Cato, uh, named after uh, Cato's letters which in turn were kind of indirectly named after Cato the Younger. But um, it, it, philosophically, it's a good name since we want to see a uh, renaissance of the ideas that energized the American Revolution. And Cato's letters were read by Jefferson and Paine and, and Sam Adams and some pretty radical libertarian types in the American Revolution. We, the name fit fits. The problem is to make a logo – out of C-A-T-O, you have to use all caps or it looks weird with a capital C and a small A. That's just more than you guys need to know. But, <laughs> but I, but so people think it's a Central Atlantic Treaty Organization or something. <laughs> Crane and the Others. Crane and the, Crane and the Others yeah. is, is what it originally was meant to be. But, <laughs> but no, that's a, so that's how that got started. And But Murray, Murray left Cato. Oh, yeah. Murray, Murray was a great – guy to have as a friend. He was so funny and full of life, and, uh, uh, but he was not a good guy to have as an enemy. And uh, Murray um, was very keen on Inquiry Magazine, which was one of Cato's first projects, and Bill Evers was the editor, and it was aimed toward the left. 
it, it was really well done, but it was uh, – it turns out the left is not that interested in libertarianism as much as you'd think. I mean it, when you think about, well, we should agree on civil liberties, we should agree on – on foreign policy, but you know, the left is as interventionist in foreign policy as anybody these days, and uh, and uh, in terms of civil liberties, I mean, they don't even believe in free speech anymore. It also feels like they, the left, is rather willing to let their views about economic liberty trump anything else. Yeah. So no. so they'll set civil liberties issues aside in mm -hmm. order to. Regulate and control regulate, yeah. The tax. Yeah, they the, the intellectuals there see no difference between economic power and political power. To them, it's all coercive, and that's just a fundamental mistake. It's much more, uh, you know, it, it's much better if you live in a society where you can tell Ford after their hundreds of millions of dollars telling us to buy Edsel's, you can tell Ford, Ford to shove it. But you know, when the government tells you to do something, you got to pretty much do it. So it's it's a distinction the left doesn't make, and it's really a, a shame that they can't see that. You mentioned that uh, that Murray is uh, great as a friend and horrible as an enemy, and he he was he had that sort of purity strength vein in him of trying to decide who was against him. I think that probably Murray would have said the same thing about you in his own way, right? Like that was a got, got pretty high level of animosity there uh, in the eighties. He didn't like me. That's that's you know, that seems to happen to me from time to time. <laughs> but Murray, you know, uh, Evers was the editor of Inquiry magazine, and and they thought they died and gone to heaven. That that was their goal was to reach the left. That was always, and Evers himself was from Stanford and was just obsessed with what his Marxist academic friends would think if he said this this way or that way. and uh, and But it was draining all the funds out of Cato and the readership was not that big. So we uh, shut it down and, uh, and when they got word of that, then uh, Murray um, talked David Thoreau, who runs the Independent Institute now in Oakland, uh, um, Got he was in charge of academic affairs for Cato and a bright, very bright guy. Um, they got him to call Charles Koch to um, talk Charles into firing me so that they can keep Inquiry Magazine going. And as soon as he hung up with Charles, Charles called me and said, "Ed, I just thought you'd like to know that uh, your guy Thoreau there wants you to be fired." And so I walked into Thoreau's office and said. David, you're fired. And uh, he immediately understood what had happened. He said, well, can't we still work together? And I said, uh, no, we cannot. You know, actions have consequences and you're gone. Who were the first employees of, of Cato other than you? On, the day, on day one when the doors opened? Well, there was, there was uh, Ralph Rako and Bill Evers and then, uh, you know, some secretarial help. But it was very small. And, uh, uh, and we got our nice offices and, and um, got off and running and the magazine was a good good product uh, and we started gradually doing the public policy work. And how big was it by the time you moved to D.C.? Well, uh, when we moved to D.C., we were, we were getting rid of uh, Inquiry Magazine and we're scaling it down. So, I, I, you know, a lot of people just stayed in uh, – in San Francisco, I don't think there was more than five people that went to the – but we soon had 20 people or so. Uh, and we had this townhouse on 2nd Street that was really terrific. One of the neat things about it is one of the few townhouses in, in uh, on Capitol Hill that had a nice backyard. And so we would have – we could squeeze about 80 people into the dining room, living room area for forums and then afterwards have a white wine reception and it became a, a kind of a cool place to go in Washington and it helped us uh, early on quite well. Did you feel like the early days of the Reagan administration had libertarian possibilities to it that were maybe quickly – those hopes were quickly dashed? Mm, I didn't appreciate Reagan back then as much as I do now. Uh, but, um, you know, we were in competition. I. I uh, when I was running the uh, McBride campaign, I wrote a letter to Reagan, who at the time was calling himself a libertarian, 
and talking about how libertarianism is the essence of conservatism or republicanism, I think. And I listed, you know, half a dozen things that he says and believe that weren't libertarian. And he wrote me a very thin-skinned letter. I gotta find it. I, I know it's around somewhere. Um, yeah, you should find that <laughs> if it's handwritten by Ronald Reagan. That would yeah, be, yeah. It, it was. <laughs> and uh, Sam Husbands, who passed away a couple of years ago, was a dear friend of mine and on Cato's board. But also, Sam was a um, uh, a good friend of Reagan's, and in fact, was uh, Reagan's. Um, what do you call it when um, uh, people come in from out of town and um, house guest? No, <laughs> director of uh, oh, uh, not etiquette, but whatever. You mean uh, inside the White House? You mean no, no. Oh. When he was governor of California, oh. uh, reception protocol. protocol. Okay, he was in charge of protocol, and, w- and in fact, we got when I took over the Libertarian Party and 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 had, had moved to San Francisco, I had got. Uh, um, Sam Husbands to agree to quit the Republican Party and join the Libertarians, and also a guy who was Reagan's uh, um, appointment secretary, Ned Hutchinson. Um, Ned uh, was quitting the Reagan administration. Ned loved Reagan, but he said, you know, the guy just doesn't care who works for him. Somebody will come in the office, and of course, Ned was in charge of, of who they appointed to positions. And, and somebody come to me and say, uh, well, you know, uh, Bill Carey, uh, I met him at a cocktail party, really nice guy. He should be, you know, insurance commissioner or something. <laughs> and Re- Reagan would come in and, and, and tell this story and, um, and Ned would say, but Governor, we don't know him. No, no. You know, I'm, I'm assured he's a good guy. So they filled up – and that happened clearly when he was president too. I mean he pointed a guy uh, as a secretary of education – who uh, campaigned to create the Department of Education. Which he campaigned against. Which yeah. he had campaigned against and won, you know. Um, and then he appointed uh, a dentist as uh, Secretary of Energy, the guy who knew nothing about energy policy. Um, so, you know, I, one of the great failings of, of Reagan was personnel. And uh, uh, the biggest personnel failing was George H.W. Bush. Those guys during eight years uh, in the White House, had uh, lunch once a week. And that's a lot of lunches. Uh, and if uh, all those lunches, if Reagan couldn't figure out that, that Bush didn't have an ideological bone in his body, that's Reagan's fault. And, um, you yeah, know, Reagan was – it wasn't a um, – a libertarian administration by any sense, uh, stretch of the imagination, but my, he had some very, very good people working there. And the first thing Bush did when he took over, and, and Bush was never elected, Reagan was elected for a third term, uh, was fire them all. The only one he didn't fire that I'm aware of was Bruce Bartlett, who was in Treasury. and uh, But it kept a very low profile, and then it Turns out Bruce Bartlett's a status. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to okay, you the letter that Reagan sent you. You said it was a thin skin. What, what, what did it? Well, I'll, say? Yeah, he says, I'll call myself any damn thing I want I was, to. Okay, <laughs> and and uh, and then he, uh, you know, I wrote back and and uh, you know Sam Husbands wrote a letter and tried to calm the waters and I, I think essentially uh, did. But I, as far as I know, Reagan never called himself a libertarian after that. And I'm not sure that that's a good thing. I probably should have just shut up and and, uh, tried to refine his libertarianism. So when Murray Rothbard actually finally left Cato, there's this claim kicked around that you stole his shares of Cato. I, Ed Crane? I think he said said Charles Koch did. But uh, they were in Wichita. You know, if you knew Murray, you didn't want to give him any papers. He, He was not very well organized. <laughs> but um, um, he uh, had actively worked to get rid of me and it, you know, it, was, it didn't take long to discover that Thoreau's actions were uh, initiated by Murray and Bill Evers but basically Murray. And so that, uh, that was kind of a, you know, undermining the, the structure of the organization and, and, uh, and his – attitude was that he wanted Cato to focus on appealing to the left and 
and was engaged. You know, he considered himself, and so did Bill Evers, uh, Leninist. And part of that uh, strategy, the Leninist strategy, is to lie, cheat, and steal if you have to. Whatever you say it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're if if uh, if you're after a bad guy, then you just cut him down any way you could, and that's the way they operated. And and Charles, I think, saw that, and so uh, we just said, you know, this is not working out. So uh, the majority of shareholders voted to, and that was well within the the bylaws of the organization. The majority, in fact, everyone except Murray, of course voted to, to take away his shares. They weren't stolen. Let's turn then to another future shareholder in Cato and the guy who, I mean, played a large role in really putting Cato on the map in Washington and that's Bill Niskanen. Mm -hmm. As it relies to the, it also has a connection to the Reagan administration too. Well, yeah, he was, he was uh, on the – Council of Economic Advisors, and um, I had made a point to get to know him uh, when he was appointed to the, the council and um, walked into his office one day, and it was the size of a football field. Uh, the, the, in the old executive office building has these ridiculous, huge offices, and, uh, you know, Bill could care less about that sort of thing, but uh, and I told him I would love to get you uh, to work at Cato, uh, you know, when you're done with the council or whatever. And he, uh, going into Reagan's second term, uh, assumed that he would be, because he was at the time acting uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And he assumed that, that when Reagan was reelected, he would be permanently the, the uh, and Reagan over, you know, didn't want him. I could see where his people would say, you know, Niskan is a loose cannon, Mr. President. We, uh, we, we have to be careful about that. We don't. So they wanted to keep him on the council, but they wouldn't make him uh, chairman. So he quit. And one day he, there's a knock at the front door on 224 Second Street. And I opened the door. That's how many people we had. I opened the door. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's this uh, six foot five inch uh, the Scannon uh, standing there, and they said, Where, "Where's my office?" And that's how he came to work at Cato. Probably wasn't as big of office. It as was the size of this room right <laughs> now. Yeah, it's about eight by ten, eight or, by something. 10 or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he didn't complain. Never complained at all. Uh, what a what a wonderful person he was. He was, uh, you know, not a hardcore libertarian, uh, but he was very sound on on basic principles. I always thought Bill was took economics too seriously. I mean, he'd read some book or some, you know, journal article, and, and that was the truth at that point. Uh, he did say it, uh, one, to his credit, you know, he would ask, why uh, why is uh, there a number to the right of the decimal point? And the answer was to prove that economists have a sense of humor. <laughs> Which is because really the number to the left of the decimal point also proves they have a sense of humor in my view. But uh, beyond that, though, Bill was a man of tremendous integrity. And uh, his wife, Kathy, uh, his widow, has just been a stalwart uh, in all the difficulties Kate has faced uh, in recent years. Um, and she remains on our board. But um, – but him joining was was a it was big a deal. huge thing. It gave us credibility, and uh, and um, so I'm I have nothing but uh, fond memories and admiration for Bill Niskanen. Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, aside from the history. Uh, we, you wanted a think tank in the sort of AEI Brookings model, but in terms of your broader principles of Cato, your, your sort of founding idea of what Cato was, the attitude behind Cato, like the purity, was it, were we going to be a purity test? Were we going to work with the government more? And, and how, how did that work? And so, for example, you have like different rules for Cato, like uh, there's no endowment, for example, is, is one. Yeah, I, I think endowed organizations tend to get lazy and it's just human nature. If you know where the money's coming from, uh, you know, it, it, you don't work as hard. Um, and and the another, another element of that argument is that uh, people are giving you money to fight the battle. Why, why do you want to – if somebody said, I'm going to give you $100 million as an endowment 
and you're gonna uh, you're gonna make um, you know back in the good old days five million dollars a year, and that will be what you'll spend. In the meantime, you got a hundred million sitting on the sidelines, uh, and so in five years you will you know spend twenty five million dollars. But you could have been spending twenty-five million a year for four years, or five when you count interest in. Uh, so I always thought that, that that I never tried to raise money for an endowment. I mean, you can consider the building we're in right now an endowment in the sense that Cato has, you know, there's there's no mortgage payment, there's no interest payments, uh, no rent. Uh, Cato owns uh, this place a hundred percent, and. Uh, it's such a beautiful facility. I mean, the uh, ideal uh, thing for a think tank. Now, what about uh, ideological purity tests? As another, what what is the Cato purity test? Because uh, that, that's something we get criticized. It kind of goes into the Murray story too. Well, I, how I, would you describe that that purity test I, if there is one? No, there's well, I mean, David Bowes and I uh, really always saw eye to eye on what. Cato's philosophy was, which was libertarianism uh, presented in a realistic uh, framework, as be as radical as you can be without being irrelevant to the debate. And uh, sometimes, you know, you're too radical and sometimes you're not radical enough. It's a constant uh, judgment call, but I think Cato over the years has done a pretty damn good job of Maintaining a you know non-interventionist foreign policy, a strict respect for civil liberties, and uh, and a, a rational approach to uh, economic liberty. Um, the work we've done on the Constitution has been uh, you know path-breaking, um, and free trade. I mean, Cato is all of our positions are designed to enhance liberty, and and of course when I say our. I'm no longer an employee of the Cato Institute, and uh, so I don't speak for the Cato Institute, but these are just my my views, and you're talking about our history. What about funding sources? I mean, I know that I have been told by people that, you know, everything that I say and everything that my colleagues say is just we're, you know, parroting the corporate over the beliefs overlords. of yeah, the yeah. corporate overlords <laughs> that that sign our paychecks or things well, like that. I'm very much in favor of funding uh, sources. Uh, me too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Cato, you know, early on started uh, uh, doing an analysis of corporate welfare, and I'll guarantee you that did not win us friends in the corporate community. We have never uh, taken positions that uh, that that uh, in order to appeal to some corporation or some special interest group. Uh, we've been very good about that, and and uh, you know, in the recent conflict, we got a lot of support from across the political spectrum, and and one of the common uh, elements of that was that Cato sticks to their principles. Uh, so we've always wanted to be a part of the debate, but pushing the debate toward liberty and whatever the area was. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a shame that uh, more people on the right haven't been like Rand Paul, for instance, really appalled at what the NSA is doing and um, the IRS and the kind of the civil liberties abuses that are uh, just endemic to to this administration and I think to the Bush administration. Now, of course, we don't take uh, government money because that would be about as hypocritical as you could possibly be. No, but... the board has a, a resolution that says we cannot take anything under $5 million. <laughs> from the well, we could just suck the you know. I well, guess. I, that was a joke. Yes, you know? yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the but the uh, you have any favorite stories about some of the stories people like to tell about you around here? You denying or telling possible donations to take a hike because of what they wanted from us, like Fanny and Freddie, for example. Well, that's right. There's a guy. What's his name? One of the Buckley cousins or whatever. Had a senior. He was a public affairs guy for for uh, Fannie Mae, and he wrote me a letter uh, saying, "Good news, um, we're, uh, Fannie Mae is going to give you uh, give Cato a hundred thousand dollars." And uh, you know, back then that was a lot of money, and uh, I guess it still is. But it was it was right after Reagan was elected. Uh, 
you know, it was maybe 81 or 2, and Fannie Mae had been living off the left, off, off Democratic, uh, um, you know, Democrats giving them money, and and, uh, uh, and now that there was this new conservative push, they had to, um, they wanted to cover their ass and cover their bases and and get, give money to uh, groups that might be critical of them. And so I wrote back and said, you know, we, um, I first went to Bill in the scanner, who was our chairman. I said, Bill, this is, this is government money, right? And he said, absolutely. So, we, so I wrote back and I said, we don't take money from government. And uh, he was furious. How dare you say that? And, uh, you know, what do they have? 85% of the mortgage market is because they're such good workers or because there's an implied <laughs> government guarantee. So, uh, yeah, that, and we've done that. You know, people will come to us and say, I'll give you money if you do this or that. And we just say, no, that's not what we do. Um, now, there could be, you know, times when certainly when we see something that we want to work on and and there are can be corporate or, or foundation interests uh, and they come to us and say, we want to help you with that. And that's fine. But we get such a small percentage of uh, the budget from corporations. I mean, it's under it's under five. It has gone under three, under two yeah, yeah, percent yeah, at one point. Yeah. yeah. So you know, they could take all that, and it wouldn't affect us at all. So Cato's been around now for almost forty years, um, and so today, what do you see as the the role that Cato plays in Washington in the national policy debate? Well, you know, people say this is the libertarian moment, and I think it is, and I think it, that Cato deserves uh, a good portion of the uh, uh, of the credit for for that, because everyone can see the failure of government on the left and on the right, and uh, to me, the real secret to the libertarian moment are independents who are uh, put off by the the social conservatives. And uh, and who also realize that this high tax and spend agenda of the left doesn't make any sense either. When has the government had some new big project that actually worked? I mean, the incompetence is just appalling. And uh, more and more Americans see that now. And so, uh, you know, my uh, friend John Malone, who uh, was on the board for uh, 20 years or more, uh, uh, he, he, a big businessman, uh, Liberty Media, and uh, uh, big in the cable industry, he, he used to say, and quite seriously, the thing I like about uh, Cato is it's so moderate. It's in the middle. And when you think about it, you can make that case. Uh, you, you know, you're socially tolerant, which I think most Americans are. You believe in capitalism, but not crony capitalism. Which you know a lot of a lot of independents are understand that distinction and and they'll say they don't like the Republicans because of the crony capitalism, which you know goes on. I mean you know Bill Clinton of course is a Democrat but he's one of the great crony capitalists of our epoch, um, and so uh, I think that Cato is very well positioned. It's got it's got good leadership. It's got very very bright people who are committed uh, to this cause. It's such a, for a libertarian, such a great place to work because you have people, and everyone loves to work here that if, who's a libertarian uh, because it's you're surrounded by people who share your passion for liberty. And maintaining that, uh, that detached analysis. I mean, the thing that I really like about Cato, I mean, one of the many things I love about Cato, but, but the fact that we are detached from the partisan struggle, which I think gives us at least some sort of imprimatur of oh, it of, does. Of, I mean, unbiased uh, at least. Yeah. You know, I'm, I now that I don't work for Cato anymore, I can say that I think Heritage uh, made a horrible mistake when they decided to jump in bed with the Republican Party, because what the Republicans needed was a conservative organization like uh, like Heritage, which you know had very bright people and and still does, and uh, was run by a very competent guy at Fulner. Uh, and uh, yet the, you know, when, when, when George H.W. Bush was elected uh, to, uh, to the White House, uh, Heritage acted like, you know, they, they took, they took um, you know, victory laps. Like, this is wonderful. We finally won. And I'm looking at George H.W. Bush. I say, are you kidding me? And that, 
what 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 the GOP needed was a conservative heritage foundation screaming at them for the the, the transgressions and the and the uh, lack of principle and and they didn't get that they got cheerleaders and that was too bad but um, uh, so why but, do people think we're Republican? Well, I don't think I think the I think the sophisticated people in the media understand that we're not and uh, uh, you know. Cato prides itself on being very quick to criticize either party, and we're just as critical of the GOP as as the Democrats. I mean, that said, the Democratic Party is really doesn't stand for anything good anymore. I mean, we talked earlier about uh, they don't uh, you know this this speech code stuff and. Uh, and their, you know, willingness to uh, intervene militarily for humanitarian reasons, God knows what other reasons, because the Clinton Foundation may want to do something. <laughs> uh, you know, they're <laughs> hard to justify. I, Nat Hentoff, um, the great civil libertarian who in the 20th century was the greatest defender of the First Amendment, uh, is just appalled at, at what's happened to the left. Uh, and he, you know, he comes from the left. Um, but Nat's a senior fellow with Cato now, so good for him. When I tell people where I work, what I do, um, there's there's often a question about what exactly is a think tank? What do they do? I mean, people know there's, you know, they they understand what like lobbying organizations are, um, <clears throat> but and special interests and whatnot. But the role of that think tanks play. In this whole process, well, Cato is a true think tank because we're we're looking at problems confronting our society and trying to come up with solutions that uh, entail more freedom. And um, uh, so, Cato is a very principled organization that that takes a philosophy. We don't claim to be value free. And Cato has, has got a philosophy of libertarianism. And there are good ways and bad ways of applying that philosophy to the problems of our day. Uh, but, um, you know, I think Brookings is kind of like that except that their agenda is, is liberal, uh, contemporary liberal. Uh, and so they're more – and, and, and uh, uh, AEI under uh, Brooks is, um, is uh, that way with a conservative approach. But I think – Think tanks are very important because they shouldn't be caught up with special interest groups or uh, any kind of political party. So broadly speaking, as as we move into Cato's approaching 40 years and going forward and libertarianism in general, we have things like Heritage, which are really staking out on the red side and then Center for American Progress on the blue side and Cato sitting in the middle and maybe this libertarian movement. Are you generally optimistic for both A, the future of the country and B, the future of Cato? I am optimistic about America. I think this is uh, such an incredible country and we were so fortunate to have all these dead white guys uh, <laughs> put their mind to the uh, – how do you create a free and prosperous society and the uh, first time in human history really that it was spelled out so clearly. I think they would have been – they're very sophisticated people and they understood public choice and they understood the likelihood that Special interests would get control of government and, and undermine the, what they were trying to do. They'd be surprised that it lasted as long as it did. But there's a renaissance of respect for the American Revolution now and Cato is at the forefront of it intellectually. So I think it's uh, – I think, I think there is – you know, when, when, when Reagan got elected, the establishment, the pro-government establishment – on the left and the right, I think we're shocked that there was this positive response from the American people to the way Reagan described, the, you know, this is a country that you don't have to be ashamed of. We have every reason to be proud of, of our heritage of liberty and the thoughtful initiatives that the uh, founders undertook to secure that liberty. Uh, and, and Americans said, damn right. And that – uh, the establishment was really uh, uh, surprised, but it's still there. It's still ingrained 
you know, Hayek used to uh, talk about uh, cultural evolution and and how um, you have, you know, little things like a, a kid selling lemonade on a street corner is a sign that you live in a free society. I mean, it's probably illegal to do that now. But, <laughs> but uh, there are elements of our society just deeply ingrained in our culture that mean – uh, that means that we have a chance that that if we articulate a vision of liberty uh, that touches on those um, basic sentiments of American culture, uh, you can succeed. And uh, I, you know, I the support for Rand Paul I think is uh, remarkable, particularly given what a thin-skinned guy he turns out to be. Uh, but he's very smart. I don't know if you guys saw the. The filibuster he uh, did, but it was uh, remarkable. No notes. It was like a, uh, a college lecture in the Constitution. And our work, you know, Roger Pallon has done, and Ilya Shapiro now, uh, to carve out a third way to go back to the original uh, concept of what the Constitution was for has been very important. And there are a lot of Tea Party people that appreciate that, and I think there are more people on the left now who understand the Constitution is there to protect our civil liberties. And, um, and we can we can turn this thing around, not least because the other side fails at every initiative they come up with. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.